and good morning, church. Thanks for joining us in our virtual lobby. Over the next 30 minutes, our hosts and pastors will be engaging all of us in some key events and activities coming up in the life of our church on how our week has been going and joining us in prayer. If you're currently watching us on our YouTube channel, we'd love for you to participate in this virtual lobby. You can do so by visiting our church website and clicking on the Join Us button. It's just that simple for all of us to come together as one global church family. Now, let's continue to connect virtually and greet one another as we continue our morning in worship together. I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And your love for God's people everywhere? I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We pray that the eyes of our hearts will be opened so that we can know the hope of our calling as his holy people.
this year, we're kicking off our global mission conference, DNA 2021, with guest speaker Daryl Johnson. Daryl Johnson has been preaching Jesus Christ and the gospel for over 50 years. He served as senior pastor for a number of congregations in California, Union Church of Manila in the Philippines, and the historic First Baptist Church in the heart of Vancouver, Canada. During his time in the Philippines, he traveled throughout Asia, speaking at various churches, conferences, and seminaries. Daryl has taught on the subject of preaching for seminaries and colleges in North America. He's the author of eight books and currently serves as scholar in residence for the Way Church and Canadian Church Leaders Network. Daryl and his wife Sharon have been married 49 years. Together, they have raised four children, adopted from four different countries of the world, and enjoy loving 11 grandchildren. Join us on May 30th as we kick off our Global Mission Conference with Daryl Johnson. Hey Church, I'm Michelle, and I've been calling People's Home for five years now. I love that we're a globally engaged church, and that mission is at the heart of everything we do together as a church body. I am constantly amazed at how God is working through our global partners who are serving with their whole lives in so many different parts of our world. Especially during DNA each year, I find myself being inspired and challenged for missions in new ways. And one main way is through Faith Promise. Faith Promise is a prayerful pledge we get to make individually and together as a church for global missions in the coming year. I want to encourage you that though we may not always see the fruits of our labor or pledges, God still uses us. God still uses you. When my husband and I decided to serve in long-term missions, he came to a point in fundraising where he was short of the amount he needed. That same week, an anonymous person in his church at the time came into some extra funds and donated the exact amount he needed so that he was able to move forward to continue doing God's work. Though he never found out who it was, their act made an enormous difference to us and also those our team was able to reach. I hope you'll join with our church family during DNA in doing three things. Pray, pledge, and persevere. Pray for the Holy Spirit to show you where you can grow your faith in intentional generosity and ask God about what he would have you pledge for global missions. When you're ready, you can make your pledge by visiting the church website to complete the pledge form. Once you've submitted your pledge, persevere. Look forward to how God provides, and as He does, follow through on your pledge throughout the year. Let's do this together in God's global mission.
We hope that you had a chance to say hello to someone you know this morning. And if you're new, we hope you got a chance to connect with someone. As we get ready to enter into our live stream service this morning, we want to remind you of a couple things. If you're watching on our YouTube channel right now and want to engage in the chat in post-service prayer time, you can do so by visiting our church website and clicking the Join Us button. Second, our pastoral care team will be available in the chat for 30 minutes after the service to engage you further around the message, answer any questions you have, and for an extended time of prayer. Just click the Request Prayer button to connect with someone. Church, let's quiet our hearts now as we focus in together on the Word of God in our songs of worship and a message from Scripture. I'm looking forward to continuing with you in worship.
Good morning, church. Welcome to DNA 2021, our global missions conference. I want to start by asking you a question. When you look out over our world, what do you see? Take a moment to think about that. And when you look at your neighbors, who do you see? Questions like this are some of the questions we're going to be asking as we come into 2021 Global Mission Conference. We're going to take some time as the people of God to think, reflect, remember, and celebrate what God is doing in our midst and around the world. We're going to hear Christ's invitation to see differently. And what we see throughout the scriptures is that God is often moving through people who see differently. We see that in the book of Exodus when God brings his people out of their bondage to Egypt to the edge of the promised land. Twelve spies are sent in. Ten come back and all they could see was the obstacles before them, their own weakness or inability. But two others, Joshua and Caleb, they come back and yes, they see the obstacles. Yes, they see their own inability or weakness. But they also see the God of promise, the God who was sovereign over the kingdoms of the world. And so that's the type of perspective that we're inviting God to reveal to us. So with so many images swirling around in these days, how do we learn to see differently? Well, it all begins with worship. Remember, effective mission begins with sincere worship. And we know It's sometimes challenging to worship online. But don't just watch, friends. Really enter into the worship every Sunday. And during our Global Mission Conference, we're going to have an opportunity to worship with our brothers and sisters from all over the world. So please join us for our global prayer gathering when our brothers and sisters from Uganda and Mexico and the Middle East are actually going to be worshiping with us. And through that, we're praying that God will help us get a whole new perspective on who he is and what he's busy doing. We also see differently when we enter into his word. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to have various Bible teachers with us. Daryl Johnson's with us today. Mike Gore's going to be speaking in a couple weeks. And Midweek, we're going to be having intriguing Bible studies where we invite the Spirit to teach us to see differently. And stories. Stories are so powerful. And they're always one of the highlights of our Global Mission Conference. When we get to hear the stories of missionaries, the stories of people just like you, and how God has been so faithful and has answered prayers. Next Sunday, we're going to hear the stories from some of our missionaries. And throughout the week, we're also going to, in our small groups, be having missionaries come and share the stories of what God's doing. Together, we're going to be watching a powerful documentary that tells a story that many of us have never heard, an important story of people who are forced from their homes. So please don't miss Life Jacket when we will hear a life-changing story So many of these stories are what actually impacts our Christian lives and can change the whole direction of where God's leading us. And church, there's more stories that we can get to within three weekends. And so we've also created a global mission report this year. You can go online to access that. It's available there. And it contains so many other stories of what God's doing around the world. So we see differently through worship, through sitting under the word, through being witnesses to what he's doing. And we see differently through prayer. Prayer is our breath. It's how God shifts our perspective and helps us to see things in a different light. So all through the week, go online, engage with We Pray. It's going to have a global emphasis during our mission conference. 
And in the report that Brett was just talking to you about online, there's lots of opportunities to engage in prayer. And for this year, we're going to do something completely new, and we're so excited about it. We're going to invite every one of you to go into your particular mission field, your neighborhoods, and do a prayer walk. We're going to be doing this all together in our respective neighborhoods, and we're going to be praying for our neighbors and asking God, what does He want for our neighbors? What is he longing to do? And what is he already at work doing in our neighborhoods? And we're praying that we will all see differently through this experience. And we know that when we pray together in community, that we are prompted by the Spirit to engage in his global mission. He starts to open our eyes. So at the outset of conference this year, let's just pray together. Lord, we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts. Give us vision for what you're doing globally so that we can join you in what you're doing. And we ask this for the glory of your great name and for the salvation of the nations. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And your love for God's people everywhere? I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We pray that the eyes of our hearts will be opened so that we can know the hope of our calling as his holy people. church family. It is so wonderful to be with you here on the first week of DNA. We have this amazing saving grace, this freedom in Christ that we can celebrate together as a church. So will you please stand wherever you are, grab your instruments, and join us in celebration as we worship God this morning. Jesus rescued me. 
Amen. Lord God, we thank you that we can celebrate this joyous freedom. And Father God, as we focus our hearts and our minds on you, as you change our hearts to see things the way that you do, as you break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord God, we pray that you will heal our hearts and make us new. And Lord God, every tribe, every tongue will sing hallelujah. Hallelujah to you, Lord.
Hello, church. What a pleasure it is to be here today. We are going to be reading through the book of Acts. And as we do, we're going to be praying for our mission partners, for their families, for their ministry coworkers. In fact, I have the privilege of being here with one of our mission partners right now. This is Hyun Kim. It's such a joy to be with you, church, this morning to worship. I've been serving with SIM, serving in mission for the last three and a half years, serving as their global director for people development. And what that means is I have the privilege of being able to oversee the care, the development, and training of our global mission workers around the world. We are so glad that you're here with us today, Hyan. Church, we encourage you to follow along with us in the book of Acts. We're going to be putting the scripture on the screen for you to follow along as Hyan leads us through that portion. We'll also be displaying the text of our prayer so that you can pray along with us. Let's join our hearts as we continue to worship our God in this way. Today's Bible reading is from Acts 13, where Paul is setting off for his first missionary journey. And we learn that the good news of Jesus Christ is moving from a local context to a global context. And we're going to be reading from verse 2, where the church is gathered in Antioch, worshiping God. Let's read together. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Father, we pray that we would have ears to hear you speaking to us through the Holy Spirit today and that we would obey you fully. We thank you for our mission partners who have heard your call and followed your leading. May they hear your voice afresh today. Barnabas and Paul, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. Father, we pray that our mission partners would be confident in proclaiming your holy word today. May they confidently share the life-changing good news of Jesus' love and forgiveness and salvation. And may their message be clear, pure, and understood by those who listen. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sirius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Paul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and spoke to him. Father, we know that your Holy Spirit lives in us and never leaves us. So we ask that you would, through your Holy Spirit, enable our mission partners to speak truth in the face of lies today. May they have a renewed sense of the power of your presence living and moving in them. Paul said to Elimas, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Father, we know the enemy is dead set on destroying souls and diverting the assignment you have given our mission partners. We also know that we don't wage war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and demons. So we pray our mission partners would see victory in spiritual warfare today. Give them confidence in you, Lord God. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Father, we pray that many would come to know Christ in all walks of life, 
from the faithful witness of our missionaries. We pray that you'd give them favorable opportunities to share the gospel and that the seed of good news that they scatter would find fertile ground in people's hearts. In particular, we pray for people they've been witnessing to for a long time that have not yet opened their heart to receive your love and forgiveness. We pray that today would be the day of salvation for these precious people. And we pray for the establishing of vibrant churches that worship you well and witness to their communities through their words and actions. Father, would you protect the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health of our mission partners and their families and their coworkers today. May they experience joy in the midst of suffering. When they are attacked, may their response be love. When they're slandered, may they show kindness. When they're persecuted, may they show forgiveness. When they face hostility, may they walk in peace. When they're delayed, give them patience. And when they're set back, may they persevere. Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. And all this is possible when you are the source of our life and strength. So we pray for our mission partners that they would sense your divine presence and unwavering power in their lives right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hyan, for joining us today. Another way we can, we can continue to be a light in our world is through our generous and consistent giving. Our giving helps our global church family experience Christ and develop and grow as disciples of Jesus. As a church, we continue to give faithfully, cheerfully, and generously to the Lord. You can give by texting the word People's Give, all one word, to 77977. It is both simple and secure. You can also give by clicking the Give button in the chat. For all other ways to give, please visit our church website. As part of this year's conference, we get to hear from special guest speakers and from our mission partners serving in communities all around the world as they share what it means to see differently, to see Christ in the midst of challenging situations and in unexpected ways. We will be joining in worship with our global church family and standing in the power of prayer as we are inspired and challenged to see differently. Today, we have the privilege of introducing you to new friends to the People's Church. Brian Chung and Brian Yi Chung are the co-founders of Alabaster. Alabaster is a creative house that weaves beautiful imagery and thoughtful design into scripture to help deepen the reader's experience with God. We are excited to be showcasing their work throughout the missions conference and during our Sunday services. We encourage you to check out our website to learn more about Alabaster, including about getting a discount code to purchase products for yourself. Right now, let's take a closer look at how God has called two people to see scripture differently. So I didn't grow up Christian, and I remember my first time um, getting a Bible as a Christian. I was super excited, um, but also a little intimidated. Uh, it was this black leather Bible. Um, the text was condensed. It was on this really thin paper, and it was just unlike any other book that um, I've gotten. And so um, I was looking around the room. Uh, I had different books and magazines designed a little differently, and I thought, uh, could this be done differently? And so what makes Alabaster different is that we weave beautiful imagery and thoughtful design into the full text of the Bible. Um, we're thoughtful about negative space, we're thoughtful about the typography, we're thoughtful about what image goes alongside um, the scripture, and we're really, really wanting to deepen people's experience with God. Um, as Christians, we know the story of Jesus is beautiful, and we wanted to create a beautiful reading experience. The church used to be the center of beauty and art. We see these ancient cathedrals, beautiful Renaissance paintings, stained glass windows, all to point people towards God. And we thought, what would that look like today? And so we started off with the Gospels. Um, we launched a Kickstarter in 2016. We had 
uh, no money, no investors, no idea what we were doing, um, but the response was absolutely incredible. We nearly doubled our fundraising goal for Kickstarter. And for us, that showed us that beauty matters. Beauty matters in our understanding of who God is and that there's a longing to experience God in more tangible ways. The name alabaster comes from a passage in the book of Mark, um, the story of the woman with the alabaster jar. And in the story, we see a woman breaking an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume onto Jesus' head. The act was extreme. Um, commentators say that the perfume was worth an entire year's worth of wages. In a completely sacrificial, gratuitous act, the woman anoints Jesus' head with the only anointing he would receive before the crucifixion. Many people scoff at the woman, saying that her act was just a complete waste. But Jesus defends her and says, leave her alone, why do you bother her? What she has done is a beautiful thing. It is this complete act of giving which Jesus calls beautiful. This woman's act was a piece of art. It was generous, it was extravagant, it was full of mystery and questions and even misunderstanding. But through her art, she changed the world. As a brand, we strive to create similar pieces of art that ultimately point to the beauty of God. Art is powerful. Art has the ability to open up new possibilities, new perspectives, and new ways of experiencing the world. Great art has always done more than tell a quick, literal message. Great art and true beauty creates dialogue. It makes us think. Through our Bibles, we've seen alabaster bring people into a deeper understanding of our world and a deeper experience of Scripture and God. Church, please join me as I read through the Gospel of Luke. You can follow along in your Bible, or you can click on the Bible tab in the chat below. As we'll, read, as we'll be reading through Luke 11, chapter 1, sorry, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, you will see these beautiful alabaster images as we read. Join me. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. As we prepare our hearts to hear from our guest speaker, Daryl Johnson, we wanted to introduce you to Daryl and to the mission God has called him to. Take a look. Daryl Johnson has been preaching Jesus Christ and the gospel for over 50 years. 
He served as senior pastor for a number of congregations in California, Union Church of Manila in the Philippines, and the historic First Baptist Church in the heart of Vancouver, Canada. During his time in the Philippines, he traveled throughout Asia, speaking at various churches, conferences, and seminaries. Daryl has taught on the subject of preaching for seminaries and colleges in North America. He's the author of eight books and currently serves as scholar in residence for the Way Church and Canadian Church Leaders Network. Daryl and his wife Sharon have been married 49 years. Together, they have raised four children, adopted from four different countries of the world, and enjoy loving 11 grandchildren. Joining us for our Global Mission Conference, DNA 2021, via video from Vancouver, British Columbia. We're thrilled to welcome Daryl Johnson. I invite you on this Lord's Day to come with me into a little parable, a little parable that came alive to me while living and serving in the Philippines. From 1985 to 1989, I served as the senior pastor of Union Church of Manila, an international congregation in the heart of that massive city. When I became the pastor, the congregation was made up of people from 35 different countries of the world and from 30 different Christian denominations, which meant that I was always in trouble with somebody for not doing it correctly. During that time in the Philippines, I had the opportunity to travel throughout Asia. I spoke for a pastor's conference at Bang in Bangkok, Thailand. I taught on worship and preaching at a seminary in Tainan, Taiwan. I then was able to spend some time in Beijing, uh, preaching for a congregation based in the Austrian embassy compound in that city. And during that time, my wife Sharon and I experienced the so-called people power revolution, through which I learned more of how the kingdom of God comes into the world and, and how it does not come. The parable into which I invite you this day came alive for me because we were living in Manila in Asia. Let me, let me say that again. The parable came alive for me because we were living in Asia. I do not think it would have come alive for me in the way that it did had the Lord not called us to live in Asia. It is the parable recorded by Luke the physician in verses 5 through 8 of the 11th chapter of his gospel. It's usually called the friend at midnight. But because of what I learned, because I was living in Asia, the parable should be entitled, well, you will see. Now, as is the case with any of Jesus' parables, we need to hear and see it in its original context, in its original cultural context, and in its original literary context. So let us read the, the verses both before and after the parable in verses 5 to 8. Let us read from Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of God. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. He goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's persistence or boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking? Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you enabled Luke the physician to do his work, his research, and then to accurately write down the words that we have just read. I pray now in your mercy and grace that you would cause these words to come alive in us as never before, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can see, the original context in which Jesus teaches the little parable involves him being asked by his disciples to teach them to pray. After spending time alone in prayer, the first group of disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. You likely know that this is the only thing any of Jesus' first disciples are recorded to have asked him to teach them. There is no record of, Lord, teach us to heal. There's no record of, Lord, teach us to lead or teach us to counsel, or teach us to cast out demons, or teach us to do justice, or teach us how to change culture, or to teach us to evangelize. Not even, Lord, teach us how to preach. Just, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, why? Because, I think, the first disciples could see that Jesus healing, leading, counseling, liberating, justice, advocating, culture changing, evangelizing, preaching ministry emerges from his relationship with the one he calls Father. And they could see that the key to this relationship is prayer. Jesus is regularly slipping away from the crowd to pray. So, Lord, teach us to pray. I take the request to mean more than, Lord, give us some new prayer technique. I take the request to mean, Lord, teach us what you know about your Father that makes you want to pray. So Jesus teaches them a short form of the Lord's Prayer and then teaches them the little parable, again, usually called the friend at midnight. Clearly, in its original context, Lord, teach us to pray, the parable is intended to make the first disciples and us actually want to pray. Does it? Does it make you want to pray? Luke 11, verse 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is friend, yet because of his persistence or boldness, he will get up. Does that make you want to pray? Traditional Western interpretation of the parable, and by Western I mean in European, North American, Australian, has done two things with the parable. Number one, it has said that the parable is about the one who is asking for bread. That is, the parable is about us who pray. And number two, it has said that the parable calls us to persistence in prayer. Verse 8, because of his persistence, or as various other translations have it, because of his boldness or audacity or shameless audacity. It was because of what I learned, because I was living in Asia, that I came to see that the traditional Western interpretation is off the mark and it misses the wonderful thing Jesus is revealing in his parable. As I learned to look at life through a Filipino worldview, which I was discovering was very similar to the Middle Eastern worldview in which Jesus taught, and as I, in that Asian context, learned more about the Middle Eastern worldview through the work of 
Kenneth Bailey, missionary theologian who spent 35 years teaching in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Israel, I came to see that, number one, the parable is not about the one asking for bread. And number two, the parable is not calling us to persistence. There is a parable in Luke 18, the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. That does call us to persistence, but not the parable in Luke 11, verse 8. Because of his persistence or boldness, we now know that is not the right way to translate the word that Jesus uses. Well then, what is the parable all about? In order to see and hear what Jesus is revealing, we need to make five observations. Observation one, the parable begins with a question. Verses five through seven are a question. The only English version, Western version, I know that gets this is the ESV, uh, published in 2001. Most versions begin, verse five, suppose one of you shall have a friend. Now, if you have a study Bible, you'll notice that there is a little notation on top of the word suppose. And that notation is to guide us to what are called marginal readings. And when you look at the marginal reading, you will see the words lit, which one of you? Lit means literally, literally, which one of you? Verses five through seven are a question. In Greek, it's tis ex human, which one of you? It's one long question. Which one of you has a friend and shall go to him at midnight and send? Say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine on a journey has come to me. I have nothing to set before him. And from inside the house answers, do not bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Which, it's a long question. Which one of you? With the nuance of can you Imagine, which of you can imagine? I'm going to give the two men in the parable names, Mr. Outside and Mr. Inside. Which of you can imagine Mr. Outside receiving a traveling guest at midnight? Which of you can imagine Mr. Outside going to Mr. Inside and asking for help to feed the guest? Which of you can imagine Mr. Inside saying, do not bother me. My family and I have already gone to bed. I cannot get up and help you. Can you imagine such a scenario? Which of you can imagine? So observation one, the parable begins with a question. Observation two, the culturally expected answer. Which of you? The culturally expected answer is, None of us. In the Middle East, you would never hear, go away, I cannot get up and help you. In the West, you can imagine hearing that. In the West, Mr. Inside might call the police or at least the building supervisor. But not in the Middle East. It's simply impossible. I've tested this all over the Middle East. I've asked people in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Armenia, in Nazareth, can you imagine this scenario? And the uniform answer is no, it is impossible. I tested this all over the Philippines. The uniform answer is no. I tested this in Beijing, no. I've asked people living in Vancouver from Hong Kong, Thailand, Vietnam, India, Ethiopia, Iran, and the uniform answer is no. The scenario is culturally impossible. Why? Why impossible? Observation three, essential cultural values at work in the, appar- in the parable. Two essential cultural values of the Middle East and of Asia. They are hospitality and the avoidance of shame. Hospitality and avoidance of shame. These values are at work in a number of ways in the parable. The host, Mr. Outside, must set before his guests more food than he can eat. 
<laughs> I was taken by this the first time we were invited into a Filipino home. Sharon and I arrived with our two children. We only had two then. And there was so much food on the table. So I asked who else is coming to dinner and discovered no one else is coming to dinner. There was just no way we were going to eat all the food that was on the table. So too, in my last trip to Hong Kong, there was more food than I could eat. But culturally, you're expected to put before the guests more than they can eat. Mr. Outside asks for three loaves of bread. He's asking for the utensils with which to eat the meal. The meal would consist of a kind of stew in a big bowl. Folks would break off a piece of bread from a loaf, dip it into the bowl, and bring the bread with stew on it into their mouth, then break off another piece of bread, dip it into the bowl, and continue the process. Jesus says he, Mr. Inside, will get up and give him as much as he needs because Mr. Outside needs more than the bread. <laughs> he needs a whole lot more. He's going to have to go to the other neighbors and get some carrots and some onions and beans and mushrooms. He has a lot of work to do yet that night. One more way that the cultural dynamics are at work. The guest of Mr. Outside is a guest of the whole village, not just of Mr. Outside. Mr. Outside is extending hospitality on behalf of the whole village. Mr. Inside knows he's being asked to play his part. So observation four, the actual word Jesus uses in his parable, verse eight, because of his anidion, A-N-A-I-D-I-A-N. That's the Greek word that is variously rendered as persistence, boldness, audacity. Now get this. In the first century, this word did not mean persistence. It did not develop that meaning until well into the third century AD. If you had a first century dictionary, there were none, but if you had one and you looked up the word anidion, you would, it would not say means persistence. It would say means shamelessness. So in many study Bibles, you'll find a little notation on top of the word persistence or boldness. Again, the notation there is to take you to the marginal reading. And in the marginal reading, it says lit shamelessness or lit avoidance of shame. The newest Greek dictionary scholars have composed lists shamelessness as the primary meaning of the word. Shame is a negative quality. Shamelessness is a positive quality. Middle Eastern cultures are shame-based cultures. So are most Asian and some Hispanic and African. Roman, Greek, British, German, Caucasian, Canadian, American are guilt-based cultures. Yes, in the Middle East there are rules, but daily life is practically governed by shame. Now, not shame as, as it's used in the West, not in the sense of, oh, I feel so awful about myself, but shame as losing face, shame as losing reputation. In the West, parents discipline their children saying, that is wrong. In the Middle East, parents discipline, discipline their children saying, that is shameful. A fundamental cultural value, I will do anything and everything to avoid bringing shame on myself, on my name, on my family, on my city. Now, I learned this in, in Manila in a number of ways. One never opens a birthday gift at the party. Why? Because if you give me a gift and I do not like it, even if I try to hide it, my displeasure is going to be reflected on my face and it will bring shame on you. So I wait until I get home to open the gift. Then I can respond privately. If I do not like the gift, no one needs to know. And it gives me time to prepare myself to then meet you the next time and be able to give you thanks without this disappointment showing. Uh, when we lived in California before moving to Canada, and we lived in Glendale, California, which is the largest Armenian city outside of Armenia. And our neighbor, <clears throat> discovered it was my birthday, and she went out and bought me a gift. I'm glad I did not open the gift in her presence, because when I took it home, it was this awful, 
purple sweater. I would never wear it anyway. That gave me time to get over how awful this sweater was so I could go back to her and then thank her for her lovely gift. Another way I learned about avoidance of shame was through the so-called third-party reconciliation process. If I have an issue with you, I do not go to you directly, at least not at first. I go to another friend with whom I can freely express myself. I can get out my disgust or suspicion or anger. Then my friend goes to you, and he expresses my concerns. And then you are free to express your disgust about my disgust, or free to express your regret that, yeah, as a matter of fact, you did hurt me. And then we can finally come and meet one-on-one without either of us losing face. Would that Western political leaders understood this and took time to find ways to save the face of those with whom they disagree. So, anideon, avoidance of shame at all costs. Well, if a nideon means avoidance of shame, why have Western Bibles so long rendered it as persistence or boldness or audacity? Well, partly because Westerners could not get their mind around this concept of shame. It's still hard. But mostly because Westerners could not understand how this quality applies to the man asking for bread. How could, they could not see how this quality applies to Mr. Outside. Why does one need to be shameless to ask for bread? How does one lose face asking for help to extend hospitality to a late night visitor? Well, well, well. The question leads us to the fifth observation. Observation five, ready? A nideon does not refer to the one asking for bread. It does not apply to Mr. Outside. A nideon refers to the person being asked for bread, to Mr. Inside. It was Kenneth Bailey who helped me see this. He calls us to look very carefully at verse 8 of the parable. And in verse 8, there are six clauses. Even though he will not get up, who is the he? Mr. Inside. And he give him anything to eat, who is the he? Mr. Inside, because he is his friend, who is the he? Mr. Inside. Yet because of his anideon, whose anideon, whose avoidance of shame, I'll come back to that in a moment, he will get up, who is the he? Mr. Inside. And he will give him as much as he needs. Who is the he? Mr. Inside. If Mr. Inside is the subject of five of the clauses, is it not reasonable to assume he's the subject of all six clauses? The quality of a nideon refers to the guy being asked. It applies to Mr. Inside. Because of Mr. Inside's shamelessness, Mr. Inside will get up and give Mr. Outside as much as he needs. Are are you hearing, Jesus? Do you you see what he's revealing to us? Even if Mr. Inside hates Mr. Outside, Mr. Inside will get up and give Mr. Outside everything that he needs because he does not want the story to go around the village the next morning that he did not help extend hospitality. The point is, there is something that goes beyond friendship. It is the avoidance of shame. I'm not going to damage my reputation. I'm not going to lose face. I do not want the rumor to go around Vancouver the next morning that I did not help Vancouver extend hospitality to a late night traveler. I do not want anyone to say to me the next morning, why did you fail to help? I do not want to hear shame on you. That was shameful of you. Okay. Now we're ready to hear and see what Jesus is revealing in his parable, and it is stunning. Lord, teach us to pray. So Jesus gives a short form of the Lord's Prayer, and then he teaches the parable. The parable is not about the one who is asking. The parable is about the one who is being asked. 
The parable is not about us who pray. The parable is about the Father to whom we pray. When you pray, say, Father, hallow your name. Father, honor your name. And he does. He always does. And in this parable, Jesus is saying his father has a nidion. His father has avoidance of shame. Or to put it in more familiar biblical terms, the father always acts in a way that honors his name. The father will never shame his name. Wow. And what is the father's name? Many names. El Shaddai, El Rophe, Jehovah Jireh, on it goes. But the name above every name is the name Yahweh. The name above every name is I am who I am. The living God meets Moses at a burning bush. And God says to Moses, I hear, I see my people's affliction. I hear their cry. I know, I feel their suffering. And I come down to deliver. This is a new revelation for Moses. And so he asks, what is your name? A new revelation requires a new name. And God replies, I am who I am, Yahweh. My name is Yahweh, I am. Not I am in a philosophical sense, as though God was contemplating his own existence and, and was saying, I was being aloof. No, I am who I am in a relational sense. I am who I am with you and for you. Yahweh, the sacred name. I am who I am with you and for you. This is God's covenant name. In every covenant God made with humanity, we find the phrase, I will be your God, you will be my people. It's God's way of saying, all that I am, I place at your disposal. All that makes me be God, I place at your disposal. All my power, my mercy, my creativity, my wisdom, all of it, I place at your disposal. I am there with you and for you. That, all that wonder is packed into this name, Yahweh. And Jesus is telling us in our, this parable that his father will always honor that name. The father will never shame that name. God has gone public with his name. This is who I am. And he's placed the name on his people. These are Yahweh's people. God said, I am there with you and for you. And he does not want to hear the neighbors hear that someone came to him asking for help and was told to go away. Now, if you've read your Bible, you realize this is how the people of the Old Testament prayed. They implicitly understood all this. For your name's sake, they would pray. For example, Moses, he's out in the desert after the exodus from Egypt. God's people have been disobedient. They're grumbling and they're complaining. And God says, he's had it with him. And the best thing would do, to do would be to destroy them. Remember how Moses prays? Remember Exodus 32, 11 to 14. What are the Egyptians going to think? You said the Israelites are your people. You are there with them and for them. If you destroy them, you will shame your name. And what does the Exodus text says, say? God changed his mind. He would honor his name. The psalmist got this, especially David. Psalm 25, verse 11, for your name's sake, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. You said that if I came to you and confessed my sin, you would forgive me. This is at the heart of the new covenant. I will forgive your transgressions and your sins I will remember more, no more. Pardon me for your name's sake. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins. Faithful to what? To his name. I'm banking on your name. Pardon me. Psalm 23, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to, beside waters of rest. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Boy, the prophet Ezekiel got this big time. Ezekiel 36, verses 22 and following. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you've profaned, you've shamed among the nations where I sent you. I will prove myself holy. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will save you from all your cleanness. I will cleanse you. Why? And God says, for my name's sake. 
Do you now see how Jesus' parable answers the disciples' question, Lord, teach us to pray? Jesus is giving them and us a wonderful assurance in prayer. Yes, the Father loves us. Oh, how the Father loves us. Read Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal father. Oh, how he loves us. But even if the Father does not love us, something else is going on. The Father loves his name. He has avoidance of shame. Jesus says you can count on this. The Father will always honor his name. It turns out that God's commitment to his name translates into a commitment to his people. For the sake of his great name, Yahweh will not reject you. It's the great assurance Samuel speaks to Israel. After Israel wants a human king, like all the other peoples of the world. That is, after Israel implicitly says that we want a different king than Yahweh. Oh, how shameful. Yet, 1 Samuel 12, For the sake of his great name, Yahweh will not reject you. I said you are my people. I am there with you and for you, and I will not shame my name. Oh, this is why then pastor theologian John Piper can write, it was God's pleasure to join you to himself in such a way that his name is at stake in your destiny. Wow. God's pleasure to join you to himself in such a way that his name is at stake in your destiny. Or another way of saying it, it was God's good pleasure to possess you in such a way that what happens to you reflects on his name. The Father's name is, I am with you and for you. I give you myself. Which helps us understand what Jesus says after the parable. Luke 11, verses 9 to 10. Ask, seek, knock. It's, it is not a call to persistence, as though we have to wear God down. Rather, it's a great assurance. Assurance? Yes, why? Ask, seek, knock, because when you do, something always happens. Jesus is saying something always happens when you pray. Ask, seek, knock, they are in the present tense. And in the Greek language, the present tense conveys continual action. So literally, Jesus says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Why? Well, verse 10, receive, uh, receive, find, open. Receive and find are in the present tense. Is receiving, is finding. Listen to this. Jesus is saying, the one who keeps on asking is receiving. The one who keeps seeking is finding. He's saying that we are to keep praying because every time we pray, something is happening. What is happening? Mother Teresa of India answers well. She says, we are expanding our capacity to receive. As we keep on asking and seeking, we are expanding our capacity to receive. To receive what? God. We're expanding our capacity to receive God. Therefore, Luke 11, verse 13, will not the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking? Will not the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking? African theologian St. Augustine of the third century said that the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of the love relationship between the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. The Father delights in the Son, and the Son delights in the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of all of that love and delight. And the Father and the Son have publicly, de publicly declared their promise to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's why Jesus calls the Spirit the promise of the Father. And the Father will never be shamed. He will keep his promise. Oh, how grateful I am to have lived in Asia and to learn what I otherwise may have never learned. So, can you imagine Mr. Outside receiving a guest at midnight, needing to feed him, and going to Mr. Inside, asking for bread and being told to go away? No, it is impossible. Mr. Inside 
will get up and he will give Mr. Outside as much as he needs. Can you imagine you and I going to God the Father in the name of God the Son and asking for more of the Holy Spirit and be told to go away? No, it's impossible. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ will get up and give you as much of himself as you need. Let us pray. What of God do you need this day? What of, of God do you need in order to extend hospitality to others around you? What of God do you need? Ask. In the asking, you will receive. Something always happens. God always gives more of himself. Oh, dear Jesus, thank you for revealing what we would have never deduced on our own. Thank you for revealing the shameless heart of your Father. Help us live the rest of our lives alive to this great wonder. Amen. Church, I am so glad that Daryl Johnson could be with us this morning through technology and just on so many levels, what a reminder his message was for us. I love how God unlocked the meaning of the parable and his teaching on prayer through Daryl's global travels. Just the reminder that God speaks to us when we're at different places in the world through different cultures. But also how Daryl challenged us to see prayer differently and the reality that the whole missions endeavor, this global mission that God's calling us to join him in begins in a posture of prayer, a posture of worship. Just as Luke 11 reveals that the man who was outside the house seeks the man inside the house, we go to God asking him to meet the needs of our world that's hurting and broken. And so we're going to put Daryl's message into practice this week. Church, as part of our Global Missions Conference, we always renew our commitment to financially support what God's doing globally. And so I would invite you this week to spend time in prayer. Go to the man inside the house. Go to him with the needs of our world and ask him what he would lead you to give towards his global mission. Ask him to lead you towards what resources he put in your hand to extend towards the needs of others, what this parable was all about. And we're going to take time over the next couple of weeks to do three things. We're going to pray and ask God to lead us as to what we should contribute through our faith promise gifts towards global mission. And then I would invite you to pledge those resources that you would give them by indicator of what he's laid on your heart. And then we persevere over the course of the coming year to give our pledge that he laid on our heart. God already knows what 2021, 2022 is gonna look like. And so may we go to him in prayer, asking him to reveal what our part is financially to contribute to the needs of others. Well, church, it's been a full kickoff to our Sunday. I would ask that you give your attention to Joseph now as he outlines some details coming up throughout the week. God bless you, church. Thanks for worshiping with us today, church. It's so great to learn, grow, and encourage one another each week. Don't forget that our virtual church lobby will stay open for the next 30 minutes for you to connect, engage, and pray with our pastoral staff this morning. Next week, we'll be hearing from multiple mission partners about how God is at work all over the world and how we can see God in unexpected places, in unexpected provision, and in unexpected people. We hope that you'll join us for week two of DNA 2021 
next week as we continue to be challenged to see differently. Be sure to visit our DNA 2021 page on our church website and sign up for our Hello Church email to stay connected and informed on all the amazing events coming up over the next few weeks, including prayer events, young adult gatherings, youth events, and even a prayer walk. Church, we're excited to see how the Holy Spirit prompts us to see differently during DNA 2021. Have a great week.